Welcome to Inc.'s The Founders Project with Alexa Von Tobel. I'm Alexa, the founder of LearnVest, author of New York Times bestselling book, Financially Fearless, and second book, Financially Forward. I'm also the founder and managing partner of Inspired Capital, a venture firm focused on the entrepreneurs of the future. Each week, we sit down with a top founder to share their story of guts, inspiration, and drive. Hi, everybody. I'm your host. And this week, I'm excited for you to meet Harley Finkelstein, president of Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow a business. Harley is an entrepreneur and a lawyer who founded his first company at age 17 while a student at McGill. Harley joined Shopify in 2010 and has helped the company scale to millions of daily active users across 175 countries, driving almost $450 billion in global economic activity. Harley completed his law degree and MBA from the University of Ottawa. He received a number of accolades, including Canadian Angel Investor of the Year and Forbes 40 Under 40. He has served on the board of directors of C100 and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. In addition to all of that, Harley recently co-founded Firebelly, a modern high-end tea brand. And with that, let's welcome Harley. Harley, I'm so excited to have you on. I'm a huge fan of Shopify. Welcome. I'm such a huge fan um, of just everything that you guys have been building. For everyone out there listening, I, at this point, feel everybody knows what Shopify is. But just in case, can you just tell us in your own words, what is Shopify and what have you guys been building? Yeah. Well, I mean, Shopify is the entrepreneurship company. And what we've been building now for about 16 years is the world's retail operating system. And what we're trying to do is make the complex simple and everything else possible. And the idea really is to allow anyone that has an idea that has, you know, whether it's in the shower in the morning or has some big ambitious plans, regardless of their technical ability and their experience to start to grow and, and to manage a business of any size. And actually now, because of Shopify, you can actually go down to your kitchen table or, you know, go to a coffee shop and open up your laptop. And for very little money for $29, you can start a, a business that you know, may end up being figs, for example, which, you know, Trina and Heather started their kitchen table and ended up becoming this large publicly traded company entirely on Shopify. Help people understand how easy it is to open a store on Shopify. What does Shopify do? Give us a sense of the customer experience. So it's really easy to get started. In fact, every minute or so, a brand new entrepreneur gets their very first sale with Shopify. So we are creating new entrepreneurs on our platform. But then you know, as those businesses, not all will succeed, but the ones that do succeed as you scale, that is really where the magic of Shopify reveals itself, but it does so at the right time. So for example, not everyone needs, you know, cross-border tax compliance, or not every company needs capital, or maybe they don't need point of sale in a, in a physical retailer, but the day you do need it, it's available to you. And I actually tried this myself over the pandemic. Um, I was, as you probably know, I was one of the first merchants to use Shopify back in 2006 when I was in law school, but I had built, built a store on Shopify in uh, over a decade. And so uh, about a year or so ago, I decided I'm going to start a brand new business from scratch uh, on Shopify myself because I really want to understand what it's like to build a brand new company now. And I started uh, my side hustle called Firebelly Tea. And what was amazing was not only was I able to test and iterate and try all the new functionality of Shopify for myself, but I was able to give really great feedback to the teams. And one of the things that I loved about my own experience building Firebelly Tea about a year ago was when I hit that launch button, and again, it took me, I don't know, a couple of days to set these things up. I wanted a particular theme. I added inventory. I wanted to set up my social media accounts and connect them. But when I hit that launch button, I immediately was selling to a global audience. I was default global. And one of the cool parts about Shopify that most people don't really think about is you know, we have millions of stores. We are 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. and in other countries, we're even more than that. In other countries, we're a little bit less. But in the U.S., 10% of all e-commerce is done uh, on Shopify. So that that is that is a really cool statistic. But where really where, where the rubber meets the road here is that if you were to pretend that Shopify was a single retailer, you were to aggregate all our stores, you would see that we are the second largest online retailer in America. The reason that's important is because we're now able to use the, that economy of scale across every single touch point of building a business to reduce barriers of, of success. So for example, when you're on Shopify and you're getting, you know, let's say you need shipping labels from us, or you want to accept payments on credit cards, you need a merchant account, you are getting the rates on shipping labels and you're getting credit card processing rates that only the largest companies are able to get. It's because we are going negotiating with the credit card companies and with the shipping companies on behalf of millions of merchants. And we're giving those economies of scale to everyone that uses Shopify. So the big unlock is that 
A lot of companies talk about leveling the playing field. We are legitimately leveling the playing field so that every small business is able to compete at the same pricing, get the same customer experience that traditionally only the biggest companies on the planet were able to afford. Give us a sense of what scaling looked like. What were the what were the easy parts of scaling? What were the hard parts of scaling? Just for people who are trying to think about their long-term business plan and, and that go-to-market. From a merchant perspective, even the biggest companies on the planet, um, I've become really close with Kim Jones, who's the CEO of, of the new CEO of Spanx. Uh, she took over from Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx. And when I, I got a chance to go meet uh, her at her office in Atlanta, I don't know, two weeks ago. And one of the cool parts of when you talk to, to Kim and, and Sarah, of course, but certainly Kim, you hear that the even the large companies that are doing this, that have this massive scale, they're all very entrepreneurial. You talk to Richard, president of Mattel, same type of thing. And you talk to Tim or Joey at Allbirds, publicly traded company, same, same thing. Even though they're running companies at scale, they're incredibly entrepreneurial. And what, what I mean by that is they're looking for technology and software that allows them to future-proof their business. So when they hear that you know Snapchat is now rolling out commerce, they wanna be able to do it that day. When they hear that YouTube is doing live selling, they wanna roll it out that day. When they see that consumers uh, on their website are looking for buy now, pay later products, they wanna be able to do it that day. And so what we try to do in sh inside a shop from a, from a scaling perspective is as you grow, there is no barrier to scale or to success. Whether it's you wanna add more channels, now you wanna move from online selling to offline selling, you now wanna to move to things like Instagram selling and Facebook selling and TikTok selling. All the things that you wanna do are all available directly from Shopify and it's done in a really easy to use way. Even in terms of merchant solutions, when you think about things you need to scale like shipping or logistics or capital or payments or uh, something we call Shopify uh, markets, which allows you to sell cross-border, uh, making every store default global, as I mentioned earlier, all these things, the complexity of Shopify reveals itself, but it doesn't do so at a point where it is overwhelming. It does so at a point where like, it, w when you need it, it is there for you. And so it makes a lot of the complexity that traditionally is associated with enterprise grade platforms very complicated, you know, it, like we don't have that at Shopify. Things at Shopify are very simple and we only reveal the complexity as you need it as a merchant. What are some of the biggest unlocks or things to focus on when you have that relentless customer focus? Give us a sense of like the one or two things that you at Shopify have been just maniacal about to make sure you're building a company really, really successfully. Well, from a product perspective, we are deeply intertwined with our merchants. I'm drinking this delicious coffee right now. It's from a company called Brick Road. And this coffee mug is called Obi, O-B-I-E. And the team at Brick Road, which is a Brooklyn-based design agency, this is all they make. They make one coffee mug. They have some like promotional stuff like t-shirts and stuff, but they have one product. And it is, I believe, one of the world's greatest coffee mugs. I wanted to understand more about their business. What do they need from us? Like they're a design studio. They don't want to have to deal with infrastructure or flash sale costs. They just want to focus on what they do best. And in this case, for Brick Road, it is making the OB coffee cup. I was at a merchant's office a couple weeks ago. I actually, after the meeting was done, asked them if I could just hang out there and just check my email and do my work from there. And I just listened to all the different things. And I said, look, if anyone, you can, I said this to the uh, CEO of the company, hey, if anyone wants to talk to me about anything related to e-commerce or commerce or retail, I'm gonna be here. I'll be checking email, taking some phone calls, but I am here, I am listening. And I got a lot of great feedback. And the feedback that I find most valuable is telling me this is my problem. Because often if it's the famous Henry Ford you know, thing, if I would have asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Now, that's what I find really helpful. So that's sort of one thing which is, which is really important. I mentioned before, actually being a merchant ourselves, Shopify is a company building software and product for entrepreneurs but we ourselves are also entrepreneurs. There is a disproportionate amount of entrepreneurs and founders working at Shopify. If you think of some of our, our largest product groups, um, you know, the Shop app, uh, it's ran by Carl, who's the founder of Ticktail. Audience is ran by Daniel Debo, who's the founder of Helpful. Kaz and Glenn Coates run our, our product teams, uh, and they're both founders. We acquired Glenn's company, uh, Handshake, a couple of years ago. So Shopify is very much a company that is built by founders for founders, and I think that really, really matters. Maybe the last thing about customer obsession that I think is, is, is incredibly important is to open the kimono a little bit for them. Explain to them what is coming. So twice a year, we do something called Shopify editions. We have a sort of continuous uh, release cycle of products. So every day a new product is coming out, a new feature is coming out. But twice a year, we package up 
um, a bunch of products that we think are really going to be impactful. And we we set up a beautiful online hub, a portal, uh, editions, and, and we have a summer edition and a winter edition. And we go through each of those major product updates and innovations. We explain the rationale behind them. We show case studies and, and how merchants are using it. We show the details of it. But on a silver platter, rather than making the onus on the merchant or the customer, you know, our customer having to sift through product announcements and, and press releases and Twitter feeds, this is everything Shopify is really thinking is important right now and what we've been focused on for the last six months building. And here it is to all the merchants to utilize. And I think by actually packaging it in a way that's easy to digest, uh, we, we do, you know, we do town halls about it. We do, we set up discord channels so people can go one level deeper on each of those product releases. It makes a huge, huge difference. How has running Shopify changed for you? Just to give people a window into what it feels like on the other side of that equation. It gave us the corporate structure um, and the ability to raise capital, to bring in external investors, but it also forced us to be thought more thoughtful about what's the story we tell, how we tell it. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I can tell you one of the most fun three weeks of my life was the IPO Roadshow. And then, of course, you know, ringing the bell with my partners on the podium of the New York Stock Exchange. That is unbelievable. But I think uh, we're now seven years, I think, since, since the IPO. I think we've done a really good job of not over-rotating on you know quarterly earnings and being focused on the short term i think we're still able to make really really good long-term decisions and the, the way to do that is to make sure that the investors that we have that own you know meaningful parts of our company they really understand the shopify story they really understand what we mean by we want to be a hundred year company they understand the retail operating system they understand our product they understand our vision for where we see retail going and you know while we we cannot control the stock market day to day we, we remind our team you know that if we're up 20 percent one day or down 20% one day, uh, it doesn't mean we're 20% smarter or 20% worse off. And by relentlessly focusing on the mission, which for us is making commerce better for everyone, we think we've been able to uh, avoid the distraction of, of, of the public company stuff that most companies fall into. And, and, and so we continue to put merchants first and play for, for the long run. We try to focus on, on on the big picture here, which is like, how do we reinvent commerce? We think retail is going to be more interesting and more successful and more prosperous with more voices, not fewer. And so in many ways, our mission is not just important for us, but it's also important for the world. I want more OBs to exist. I want more brick roads to exist in the world because I think as a coffee drinker, I like that I have my Ember mug as my first coffee, which keeps my coffee really nice nice and warm. It's a it's a digital mug, which maintains a temperature. I love that's my first coffee. I like that my second coffee is an OB mug. I like that I get to switch to Firebelly tea. My life as, a, as a, just a regular human being is made better because I get to use products by people that are so deeply thoughtful. And if you think about it, if you go back you know, 20 years, uh, 40 years, 150 years, starting businesses was really difficult because it required so much money. And if you didn't succeed, the cost of failure was so damn high. That is not the case anymore. And it's not just because of Shopify, but Shopify certainly has played a big role in making entrepreneurship more accessible. Give us a sense of some of your predictions or maybe things that are just incredibly obvious to you and the leadership team at Shopify that maybe the rest of us haven't thought about. But if we fast forward a decade, what is the future of e-commerce? The future e-commerce is just is the future of commerce. I think that in the same way that we, I think we need to drop the E from e-commerce, it's all just commerce. You know, if you listen to any um, <laughs> any podcast or any you know retail conference or keynote, you'll hear the term omni-channel and multi-channel come up like a thousand times. And I think that's actually the wrong way to think about it. Like I think in the, in a couple of years, saying the term omni-channel as a strategy will be akin to saying color TV. No one says color TV anymore. Every TV is color. But omni-channel or multi-channel will simply be the, the norm. It's the way everyone builds businesses in the future. And so I think that what we're seeing on our side is that merchants come onto Shopify and they select one channel to begin with. Let's say it's the online channel or it's the they want to use a uh, point of sale for their in-store operations. Very, very quickly, they add new channels. They may add the YouTube live selling channel. They may add Google shopping channel. They may add the Pinterest channel or the TikTok channel or they do a farmer's market 
pop up and so they want our mobile app so they can they can uh, transact in person but i think the companies the brands that i see that are most successful they don't talk about channel conflict the way that some of the big retailers like best buy talk about channel conflict you hear this on these earnings calls from these traditional retailers well online is hurting offline and offline is hurting that's ridiculous if you talk to you know tim or joey at allbirds they have stores and they have online stores and they have you know they they have wholesale stores with nordstroms they are focused on selling Albert shoes, which are amazing shoes, in the way, in the method, in the channel that their consumers prefer that. And so, you know, we're trying to make it easier to think about retail as retail everywhere. I still think brands are going to need to remain very flexible and going to have to, they're going to have to be very fast, even in real life. It's not just going to be online only. But because Shopify gives merchants this unified view of their business, one centralized place where they can view all their channels in aggregate, merchants of all sizes can stay on top of their business. That's where I see things going. The other thing I see happening is that even though everyone assumes that like direct to consumer is is the new standard and i i believe that i think direct to consumer is this great business model where again going back to my my coffee cup ob sell i can buy ob's direct from uh, from brick road because they have an online store now um, there is a chance at some point that Brooker decides to put those OBs in a wonderful retail shop, a third party intermediary. That's okay too. I don't think retail or, or, or department stores are going away. I think what is going away is department stores that simply don't add any value. So my favorite, you know, t-shirts uh, are, are James Purse, a great Shopify store. My favorite hoodies are Blue Salt, another great Shopify store. I can buy those direct from James Purse and I can buy them directly from Blue Salt. But if there's a really cool department store that's also selling those and I go in there and the service, uh, the, the salesperson there is really smart and they show me the new styles or they say, hey, I love you're wearing that James Purse t-shirt. Actually, we got a great pair of pants to go along with it. Now you're adding value to me as a consumer. So as a consumer, I'm willing to invite in the intermediary into the sales process if they add value. What I think is over though is department stores simply justifying their profit margin on the basis that they have a physical store, on the basis that they have distribution. Your point of it's not going away and it's going through this amazing transformation and it must add value. Tell us just a little bit more about what you think physical re retail could look like in five to 10 years. I think one of the things that will happen is there's going to be a return to authenticity in physical retail. And so I think what we will see in retail, physical retail in the next five to 10 years is one, they're going to be an extension of all the other channels. So when I walk into a James Purse store, so Shopify not just not only powers James Purse online, we also power all their offline retail as well. Because we power both online and offline for James Purse, when I walk into the store uh, and they recognize me or they ask me for my name or I plug in my email address at the point of sale, they know exactly what I've purchased, which means immediately they know what else to sell me and what not to sell me. If I'd already bought three of their new, you know, Japanese cotton t-shirts, I don't need a fourth one, but they can say, Hey, how do you like those Japanese cotton t-shirts? Now there's a new connection. Now there's a new uh, relationship between me and the person serving me there. And so that I think is going to get better. James Purse very famously created one of the first artistic ping pong tables. I want to see a ping pong table at James Purse stores because that's what they're known for. But if they have a half pipe in it, which is what Palace Skateboards has, I'm going to immediately believe that they've lost their sense of mission, that they've lost their authentic brand. So I think we're going to return to authenticity. I think the physical stores are going to be showrooms. They're also going to be places to transact. They're also going to be places to spend time and get to know the brand better. You're going to be able to do amazing in real life activations there. But we're not going to have the separation between P&Ls where this is my profit and loss report for online. This is my profit and loss report for offline. It's just going to be one single business. Harley, one of my last questions about Shopify, and then we're going to transition to you here. You've also really embraced the hybrid model, and you've done it really deliberately and effectively. And I think for a lot of founders out there, they're struggling to not only drive progress and in, in through these you know challenging economic markets, you guys have done it really well. Can you just tell us some of the rules, some of the things you've learned that you can pay it forward to everyone else listening? Yeah. I think every company is different, and I think every company needs to deeply understand what the people that work there actually want. So we are not work at home and we are not, you know, fully remote. I'll unpack this, but the term we use is digital by design. So what this means, this model gives our team the choice to decide where they want to live and where they want to lay their roots rather than, you know, the choice being dictated by a corporate office lease. And what it's done for us, it's, you know, we're, I'm based in Canada here in Ottawa, um, but what it's done for us is it's unlocked this really diverse global workforce that can bring like their own community's perspective to work. So 
Um, we don't believe that hybrid is the way forward. We think it can lead to an even playing field when it comes to opportunities. And so what we actually think more about is like office centricity is over but we want people to work wherever is most convenient for them. That does not mean that in-person experiences are, are, are out. In fact, we are really, really intentional about in-person connections. So we turn all our offices from offices, quote unquote, into what we call ports. And these ports, which are all over the world, are these great, beautiful spaces where people can come in for off-sites and on-sites, and they can come in to do team building. And if they're, they need to work in, in a small you know, conference room with their team to ship a, a project, they can use the, the teams. And there's great lighting, and there's great design there, and it's an inspiring place. But it allow, this like through the digital by design philosophy, we're able to curate moments to bring people together for these very intentional in-person gatherings, which we call bursts. And again, they're hosted in these things we call ports. And so we've created our nomenclature around them. But what the model is really at its core is flexibility. But this idea of being flexible, but also being intentional, I think really, really matters. And digital by design gives us access to global talent, but it also allows us to build a team made up of people from that have different types of preferences in terms of how they work and when they work. But that idea of making it so that it's choose your own adventure, but being intentional but in person as well, that's the model that works really well for Shopify. And I think every company needs to figure out their own model, create their own nomenclature and their own customs and norms, but not cargo called what Google or, or Meta is doing because they're doing what they believe is best for their own company. When you're going through something hard, something's broken, something's not working, something is really challenging, have you found that in-person is really necessary? How do you think about that? Yes, there are some times where, you know, we just, we send a note out and say, hey, we gotta get together. Let's all meet in Toronto. Let's all meet in Ottawa. Let's all meet in New York. We, we, need, to, we need to get together. Let's all meet in California. There are times where things are really, really difficult and we simply call an audible and say, we're all going to the port and like, we'll be at the port for, you know, a week or two working together. There's no substitute for that energy you get when you're all in a room together and you don't leave the room until you solve that problem. And so we use that tool um, anytime we need. I just don't think remote 100% works. And I also don't think in office works 100%. Like there's a lot of people that live in cities they don't really want to be in because that's where like their company decided that's where the lease is going to be. That is ridiculous. Like I'm a city person. You and I talked about growing up in South Florida. I like cities. I've lived in big cities my whole life, Montreal, Toronto, South Florida. I love being in cities. But there are people on our team who just, they're sort of country people and they want to live more in the country and they want to have, you know, much larger yards and, and they don't care about walking to a coffee shop. They want to have a farm and they want to raise chickens or whatever they want to do, but they still may be super valuable for Shopify. So why would we disqualify them from applying simply because we once decided to put one of our offices in this particular city? And we'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Okay, Harley, I want to quickly transition to you. Um, First of all, you have been entrepreneurial your whole life. Um, you started your first DJ business at age 13, which I love. Give us a quick sense of anything growing up that you think has made you better to be an entrepreneur. I mean, a lot. My father immigrated to Canada in 56. His parents were Holocaust survivors. They were then went to Hungary after the Holocaust and then Hungary and during the Hungarian Revolution where things were really, really bad. They came you know, on, on a boat to Canada. And my grandfather, who didn't speak English, had no money, had no education, he found survival and was able to put a roof over his head and his family's head and put food on the table. It was difficult for him because he had to mortgage his whole life to get a little, he sold eggs for 65 years at a farmer's market, still exists today. It's called Le Capitaine. It's at a Montreal-based farmer's market. And I was fascinated by the fact that entrepreneurship was his survival tool. You call yourself a power extrovert. What does it mean to you and how have you leveraged that but then on the flip side, you've also described yourself as being a very anxious person. Mm -hmm. And how have you turned both of those into superpowers? I find a lot of power extroverts also have anxiety, by the way. I don't know what it is. I don't know if that, that, that rings true to some of the people you've met, but it feels like the power extrovertedness and the anxiety um, are often somewhat connected. It's not causation. Maybe there's a little bit of correlation there. I stole this term, uh, Tim Ferriss, who's a, who's a friend and has been an advisor to Shopify for a long time. Uh, he's always referred to me as a power extrovert. So I sort of stole that from him. And it, it just means that I get my energy from being around other people. I've been able to leverage that to make me really good at building relationships and trust uh, both internally at the company, but also externally. But I, I thrive off being busy. I thrive off interacting. I thrive off of hustling and, and building stuff and, and, and just doing things that are motivating the way that, you know, do you, I think the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So the way that I think about my day-to-day, -day, you know, work at Shopify is also the way that I think about, you know, planning 
my Shabbat dinner on Friday night with my family, um, or right now is Yom Kippur. And so I'm fasting today because uh, it's a high holiday. But I've been thinking about breaking my fast uh, tonight after sundown with my wife. And and not that I like spend hours on it, but I'm, I'm thoughtful about it. I'm like, okay, here's what I think we should do. And this should be really fun. And then on Saturday, like I want to think about like we have a great pizza oven. I want to think about like teaching my kids how to make pizza. And so I'm, I'm, I, I try to be as thoughtful about every element of my life the way that I am about my work. And so the power extrovert thing has been really helpful. What what has not been helpful is the anxiety thing. And I didn't actually know that I had anxiety until I started seeing a really great therapist who was like, yeah, this is like, I know what this is, this is anxiety. And the cool part about naming things and saying this is that is now that I know that, oh, I have anxiety, How do now I can say, how do I manage my anxiety? By naming it, it's allowed me to sort of harness it. And so I've always been an anxious person. Again, it just took me a long, long time to realize my anxiety is not going to go away, but rather I need to manage it in a certain way. And so whether that's through mindfulness or it's, you know, I wake up, first thing I do in the morning, other than say I love you and, and, and kiss my children and my wife, is I go for a walk with the dog. That walk with the dog for those 15 minutes, I'm not listening to music, I'm not listening to, I'm just walking with the dog. That is exactly what I need to start the day well. And then when I come back, I have the breakfast with the family and then I go and do my meditation and just do some very simple, basic breathing exercises. Well, all those things lead me to manage my anxiety and get me to a point where I'm really, really productive about it. And so rather than battling my anxiety, I'm simply trying to channel in ways that make me more productive and more, more effective. And through the pandemic, I, re I really saw my anxiety levels elevated, mostly for a bunch of reasons. One of the reasons was I was interacting with people a lot less. And so my energy levels, my extrovertedness, you know, was struggling with that. And so now I, I, I make sure that I have everything in my life that I need. And that means that sometimes I need to go for a walk middle of the day. And sometimes it means that Saturday morning, I got to wake up and I just got to go do a couple hours of work because it's on my mind and I won't be fully present for my children the rest of the weekend if I don't get those things done. And rather than separating work and life into two different buckets, I'm just trying to incorporate them into one, you know, uh, some sort of harmonious bucket. Two minutes of the interview. Harley, I'm going to ask you the quick fire round. First thing that comes to your mind, let us know. You're such a soulful person. The first thing I want to know is a book that has changed your life. Victor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning probably changed my life more than any other book. Uh, it's Frankl's story of how he not only got through the Holocaust, but but somehow thrived through this thing and came out on the other side. And it was all about him having meaning in his life. And so Man's Search for Meaning uh, has changed my life more than any other book. I love it. Uh, an interview question that you love to ask when you really want to get to know whether or not somebody is the right person to join your team. Your favorite question. I think looking for ways that like, sh like founding moments that, that I find to be really, really valuable. Your biggest pinch me moment to date at Shopify. So a day where you came home from work, said to your family, I can't believe we did that. What happened? I mean, the IPO was pretty, pretty spectacular. It's like, again, <laughs> ringing the bell, you know, on the New York Stock Exchange is, is, is up there for sure. That was a big one. Um, that, that's probably the biggest one. I mean, the other ones are every time I get a chance to like, we do some sort of large in-person event. I'm, 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 I always come home and I'm sort of blown away by that. I get to spend my, my working hours, my, my time, my life with people that I just, I, you know, they're the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And I'm, I'm lucky they want to keep me around. <laughs> Is there a favorite motto you have, a motto you live by that we should all know about? I really do believe that like how you do anything is how you do everything. And I think um, if you're really intentional about your work, but really unintentional about other aspects of your life, I feel like you're leaving something on the table. On the flip side, if you're super intentional about like your, you know, your, your personal life, but like you kind of phone into work, I think you're going to leave some potential on the table as well. And so that one's sort of that, that motto, uh, how you do anything is how you do everything is, is a big, big part of, of, of my life. Um, because it speaks to intentionality, but everything that you do, like, as opposed to kind of sleepwalking through being a dad or being a great husband or being, you know, a great leader or a great, a great individual contributor at the company. I love it. Um, first of all, Harley, you are spectacular and it's just really fun to get to see what you do over the next decade. Everybody out there, if you haven't already checked out Shopify, check out Shopify. Harley, I'm going to create a Shopify store this weekend for my seven-year-old who just wants to start a company. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. What an honor. You're just absolutely incredible and we're rooting for you. Oh, thank you, Alexa. It's an honor to be on the show.